Good morning, everybody. Can, so I um, I prepare this in the slide deck, and everybody sees the notes up there back and forth. I will be referencing them. Good morning. I am Linakos Gavras. I will be your uh, teacher today. And uh, I have a lot of very exciting things. Yeah, go ahead. I have very exciting things to go over. So um, before we get started, who here is completely new to heraldry, has not really done it, has no idea how everything oh. <laughs> That's Okay. Who here is like a pretty experienced, you know, somewhat experienced, like, you know, the hell things work, you know? Yeah. yeah. Who here is just, you know, a grand old herald of VFCA and is just here for my shining, sparkling personality? No one? Okay. <laughs> Well, I can live with that. Um, so some notes before we go forward. Um, your goal as a submission herald is to get the submitter to yes. You need to find something that they like, that they love, that they want to register, and that the college will accept. Because somebody will come to you and they say, I want the name Thorvald Skull Crusher. And you're like, ooh, well, we can't, we don't think we can do that, but... Um, you know, we can do four fold and let's get you something that has a sufficiently much of sound to it or what have you. And, you know, people come in and they, people get attached to their SEI, SEI identity, which includes the name and whatever device they want to do. And maybe they've been using it for 20 years and they're just now talking to a herald about it. Maybe they, you know, la you know, last night they just spent two hours online coming up with this. Either way, they are you know, they are attached to it, and it is their submission, not yours. They have to live with whatever they register. So this is a friend of mine's heraldry. It is black and red with three eyes on it. I would never register this. I think it is unnerving. But my friend Conrad loves it. He is so proud of it. He loves his eye heraldry. And you know what? That's great. I don't have to I don't have to apply it. Um so I will be talking about Cena a fair bit. That is the standards and evaluations of names and armory. That is the rules for heraldry. It is a document that we have that covers just about every heraldry rule you can think of. And um, the heraldic sovereigns who make the decisions, this is what they use to make them. Um, and it's also worth looking for because they are looking through because there's all sorts of like helpful charts and tables in it, like a list of every type of name a household can have, for instance. So, Cena, learn it, love it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, the appendixes are definitely your best friend. All right, so we are going to start with names. Who here has a name? Everybody good. Um, so, ev <laughs> so, every name needs to have uh, two things. You need at least a given name. And a by name. A given name is, you know, John, Sue, Thorvald, uh, you know, is usually the name you're given at birth. If, if there's a culture that does baptism, a lot of times it's given at baptism. Usually it's the name that you say first, but not every culture does, like Japanese and Hungarian don't. And then you have your by name. That is any name that's not a given name. And there are a lot of different patterns that we'll be going over. Um, but every registration needs to have at least one given name and at least one by name. That is because, you know, there might be, you know, five different Sado's in the SCA. And we need to know we're talking about Sado for Brittany, not Sado Skull Crusher. I kid. Um, so, yeah, given names. Um, you know, there are some cultures where people have multiple given names. I think in Italian, way period, you get like three or four of them. Um, oh, yeah, Spanish, too. Um, so... In Christian areas, this will a lot of times be the name of like a saint or other religious figure. Um, in a lot of Indo-European cultures, especially ones before Christianity, you'll have what are called diathematic patterns. So like St. Nicholas up there, uh, a lot of people will name Nicholas because he was an important saint. But the name Nicholas means uh, Nikos, which means victory, and Laos, which means people, the victory of the people. And so, you know, Greek does that, Norse does that, uh, Russian and so the Slavic languages do that. Um, there are non-Indo-European languages. You see it a lot in Second uh, Second Temple Hebrew and in Egyptian. So, and I don't really have that much to say about given names because there's 
you know, there's not really a lot of patterns to them other than, you know, there's certain pools that get pulled from. So what what you'll spend a lot of time with probably are bindings. And uh, there's lots of different types. And different languages might have completely different ways of going about forming them and giving them to people and how you show a name as a bind name. And often they can be marked or unmarked. So, you know, you can have Albert Miller or Albert the Miller. And he might be called both in the same document because standardization is for modern people. And, uh, but usually there is an established pattern to bind names. And if you know there is Albert the Miller and Albert the Smith and Albert the Goatherd, you can have Albert the Carpenter. Um, and in talk about all those useful tables in Cena, they have a list of by names that we know are set patterns in a lot of different languages. They don't have all of them, but there's a lot. So, for instance, you know, English has just about everything you can think of, and it talks about like how you show them in different ways, like and what the, how you do orders. So you might do like give a name and then by name or different types of by names. Um, it's in Cena. I look at it like I'd say every day, but then you might think I'm a nerd. Um, nerds in my medieval reenacting organization? Apparently? I don't know. I thought it was. Um, so the first type that you get are patronymics. This is the name of your father. In English, this is like, you know, Williams or Shepherd's Daughter. Or, you know, or shepherd daughter. Um, Stevenson. Yeah, Stevenson. Um, if you look at, oh, there's a lot of English names that are just were originally patronymics. And Old Norse is very famous. Like, you know, Hockland daughter or Grimson. Um, and like Spanish, you know, I actually recently learned like Perez, a son of Pedro, somehow Martinez, daughter of could be the daughter of Martin. Um, and you can see this in Latin record, it'll be like Filia Ricardus or Filius Henricus, because then like the in the Middle Ages they put everything in Latin, even if it was just an English name. But you know, patronymics are pretty straightforward. You also have metronymics, which is a mother's name. These are far less common and you don't see them in every culture, but like you know, you a lot of English uh, English last names like Madison or Allison or like you know names like Rose are uh, metronymics. Uh, Arabic does it decently common. So like bin uh, bin Fatima or uh, bin Labana, daughter of the milkmaid. Um, Jesus in Arabic is called um, Isa bint Miriam, Jesus son of Mary. So you see that in Arabic. You see it in the Latinizations of things. Um, and in some cultures, you could be, you know, son of this person, daughter of this person, if you really like your parents. Um, and some people get even more extra, so you'll go back through her four or five generations. So, you know, well, you might be in Welsh, you might be Dafid, Abris, Ab Madoc, and you might go back five or six generations of everybody's names in Arabic, you might be like Al Hassani, descendant of Hassan. And in Norse, you also go back a couple generations. Also, you see this a lot in Gaelic. So, like those, like, you know, the clan names, like, you know, MacDonald, O'Malley. Yeah, those are all historical ancestor names. And also, people just end up getting stuck using one last name. That's kind of what they become. Mm -hmm. So my favorite thing with Spanish is there was a Spanish uh, princess who married into the Aztec royal family. So she was like Isabella de, Moctez de Moctezuma. And there, that's still like part of the title of the Spanish royal family today is de Moctezuma because of that. And uh, mixing Spanish and Nahuatl is a whole different class. Like, uh, that's not why you're here today. And of course, you have uh, locative by names, which is just where you're from. In English, a lot of times these might be marked by at, you know, at water, at hill, at wood, or they might be just the name of the place, or they might be a proper place like a city, like Trafford of Monmouth. And so some uh, some languages you do will only do general locatives like hill or water. 
and some will only do uh, proper places like, you know, uh, London or Wales. So it really depends. Spanish does both. It could be De Tejada, Del Rio, Montañas, um, Russian, actually both Slavic languages. For instance, you could be Zaprahi if you're a frog. Uh, hypothetically, if you want to be a frog. Hmm? That's cool. Yep. I, I, and I, okay, that is school? Or how would you say that? Uh, it's school. Okay, school. Okay. How I would say it, I don't know Russian. Okay, fair. <laughs> and so um, in Japanese, it was, th there were rules about having an actual last name if you were a commoner. So a lot of theirs were just where somebody lived. So Nakamura is, you know, you were in the middle village or the Naka, you're by the rice field. And those weren't officially last names, or they kind of became them um, throughout Japanese history, which is not something I'm really qualified to go into the detail on, but it is cool. Yep. So I talked to my friend Choi Min, he could tell you all about it. Now, of course, you have occupational names, which is what you did, or maybe what your, your parents did. So, and, and and sometimes these are just the name of the job. Sometimes they were like, what you sold or what you did. So, for instance, if your name was Coffin, you were a coffin maker. Or if it was like, you know, or if you were called Bookbinder, you were, I'll let you guess what you did there. Also, English's favorite uh, raunchy poet, Chaucer, literally meant Jeffrey the Breachmaker. Because, you know, trusses are breaches. If your name was Ostringer, you raised, uh, you raised uh, Birds of Prey, for instance. I bet you knew that one. <laughs> um, so I was looking through a list of French by names from the 1200s. They had things like tennis ball maker, onion seller, um, you know, uh, somebody who made gambling dice. So you really have a lot of options for occupational. And this even goes back to, well, it says Greek, but it's probably Greece, I'm guessing. You had things like, you know, like, you know, Ekaterina the midwife or uh, Josephus the bath attendant. So these really don't have to just be baker, you know, butcher, candlestick maker for occupational names. And of course, there's the descriptive ones. So this is something that will come up if you're doing submission. Somebody will be like, I want the name Elizabeth Stargazer. And you're like, ooh. Um, because descriptive by name for something that you could say and people would know exactly what you meant. So if I said, you know, oh, that's that's John... That, that's John the Simple. You you know I'm saying he's simple. Uh, or if I say, oh, that, that's Big Jim. Everybody knows he's Big Jim. Um, so they're usually pretty to the point. And they are not always nice, not even usually complimentary. So, for instance, in English, there's something might be eat meat or short hose because he wears short uh, boots all the time. Or great shanks because he has just massive giant legs. Um, and so talking about ones that aren't always, uh, complimentary, you know, you got things like the gap toothed or the one with the nose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, and everybody knows which, you know, Donald you're talking about because he is of the nose. <laughs> and, um, again, that you can do a lot with it, but it has to be something that is pretty self-explanatory once you're, once you hear it. And these were also often not given to you by yourself. You know, somebody that you're just trying to describe people. And so you just describe them and that just becomes a by name. And so something else you see, this especially if you're looking at more official records, you see what are called dictus names or dictus, cognomento, alias. These are nicknames. And they can, can often also be derogatory or something like uh, in German, you have Lecular, which is the freeloader. So they go, the freeloader is back, or goat beard, or bitter man, because, you know, the person is always dour and negative and complaining, like, oh, here comes bitter guy again. Or my favorite in French, bull, or bull shaped. And you, you do sometimes just get nicknames like Yako. Hmm? <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. And this is also where you get things like, you know, Hank for Henry or Jaco for Jacobi. Um, so you can, in the SEA, be, you know, Jacobi Dictus Jaco, and that is a perfectly cromulent name. <laughs> yep. 
And these, uh, and finally, you have inherited family surnames. Um, and so in some places, the government came along and said, everybody has to have a surname. We need it for record keeping purposes. We, you know, and it's, you know, we, we demand it. And if you don't, you know, government will do all sorts of bad things. So that's how some languages got their surnames. Um, it's out of period, but for instance, the German government in the 1800s went to all the Jewish people and they said, okay, you're known as, you know, um, as, you know, um, as a Shlomo Ben Jakob, but now your name is Shlomo Applebaum. And we have just put that in the records and you're going to use it now. Yep. Congratulations, Shlomo. And, uh, yep. <laughs> Do you have one year to pick a name or, you know, the we will decide what your name is. Um, and now, on the other hand, there's some places, like I said, in Japan, you could only officially have a surname if you were up of one of the upper class. Peasants couldn't have surnames. And um, so this really is variable. And most inherited family names are originally by names of some kind that just kind of end up sticking and getting passed down. So it's really more of kind of a what happens to a by name than its own category in most languages. But, you know, we're talking several hundred languages with lots of variations. No rule here is going to cover everything. So a lot of languages have just weird, unusual, kind of cool patterns that don't uh, fit into other things. So my favorite thing about, like, English has what are called pageant names. Every year, the village would get together and put on a big, play and they do the same play every year and you know let's say that and they were usually religion religious and let's say you play the virgin mary every year and it is your job and you won't let anybody else do it they're just like oh yeah that's elizabeth the virgin it's not necessarily talking about her chastity she just has that role on lockdown so you'll see names like caesar virgin christ angel and these are pageant names um in Arabic, you might be known as the parent of someone, like Umbadr, Abu al Hafna. And these are just, um, and these are perfectly valid names in Arabic. You are the parent, you are the father of the curly haired girl, or, you know, Um's mom, uh, or Abadr's mom. And like Nawat, you went to the temple and you got a name that was a number and a sign three wind, one jaguar, 12 crocodile. Nobody else was doing that, but if you're making name in Nawak, that might be what you do. And so back to Sina, we always come back to Sina in uh, submissions heraldry. You have um, language groups, and these are usually pretty intuitively based, like Spanish and Portuguese are together, you know, um, English and Welsh, even though they're different language families, they were very close culturally and geographically. And there are languages you can and cannot mix them with. So a name that mixes English and French, super common. We have lots of examples. A name that mixes English and, and Japanese. If you can find record of it, you can convince the college of it, but you're probably not going to find it. So in Sina, like I said, you have this list of what languages you can mix with what. And if it's within a language group, like you're mixing Old English and Welsh, the two records have to be 500 years or less. And if it's old, if it's English and Dutch or French, it has to be 300 years. Yep. And because this is the SCA, we have special rules just for us. Uh, one is legal name allowance. Um, you can always use your legal name, at least one part of it. And that is, um, it, it's considered neutral to everything. You can, let's say your name was Ashlyn. You can be Ashlyn Lefay. You can be Ashlyn Nakamura. You can be Ashlyn uh, um, Mendez. Yeah, Averton. I'll, I'll get to that. Don't you worry. Um, yeah. Well, and that is also a uh, branch name allowance. You can always use the name of an SCA branch. Um, always, it's also considered neutral with everything. So let's say you want an Aztec name and you want to be Xochitl, which means flowers. You And Aztecs didn't really go in on last names or by names even. So you just say, I want to be Xochitl of the mists. 
It doesn't matter if you're not from the Barony of the Mists. It doesn't matter where you are, or where you're from. You can use any group in the SCA. Yes, thanks. I skipped over that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say your name is, you know, it's hard because so many names are already appeared. But like, let's say you're Ashlyn Smith. You can be, you know, Ashlyn LaFay. You can be, you know, uh, Margaret Smith or, you know, uh, uh, Yoshida Smith, what have you. Now, middle names get interesting because um, middle names aren't first or last names. Uh, some middle names are traditionally first names, like my middle name is Adam. That is a given name as long as you can find. Some middle names are last names, like somebody uses their maiden name as a uh, their kid's last name. Um, yeah, or as the kid's middle name. So, like, let's say your name is, like, my brother-in-law is, like, you know, Graham Cornell Deets. He, Cornell is historically a last name, so he could only use it as a last name. Uh, but, and so, you know, that might come up if somebody wants to use their middle name is you kind of default to what traditionally the name is. Yep. Um, there's also what's called the lingua, so lingua societatis. Um, so let's say, you know, your name is Ingvar in Rowley. That means Ingvar the Red. And, and everybody in Norse society would mean your name is just Ingvar the Red. So we let uh, a most by names be translated into English. Um, or, you know, you are Denis de Arles. You can be Denis of Arles. We, you know, translate to make it easier for everyone around you. And that is really kind of a courtesy thing just to make the names more clear. Um, you can't do this with all by names, or you can do it with most of them. There's also what's called the existing registration allowance, um, which is if you or a family member has the name registered, you can use a part of it. So, the example, like, you're like, uh, uh, Katharina de Pisa has a daughter who wants to be a Viking, and her daughter picks the name Dagmar, but she still wants to show her mom so she is Dagmar, Katharina's daughter. Katharina is not a Norse name, but it's her mom, so she can do it. We're not gonna be we're not gonna stop her. And um so that is the you know, those are just the special SCA roles that we've come up with to make people's lives easier. Um uh, before I'm done with personal names, does anybody have any questions? No? All right. So you will get somebody who says, I want a household name. And they don't have to figure out how household names work. Good luck. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> no, in all seriousness, um, you always need a designator and the substantive element. The designator is what shows it's the household. Like, it's the house, company, tavern, fellowship, uh, you know, you have ones in other languages that mean like long, uh, like Viking longship crew. And yeah, yeah there's a list of Athena as it were. And so there are a list of different things that household names can be based off of. And the thing to kind of consider when you're coming with a household name, the household kind of has its own persona. So, you know, in theory, your household isn't just the people who all get up, who all go over to Mike's house for, you know, D&D &D twice a week. It is, you know, and it's representing like a inn or tavern or like a plate name or a ship, something like that. So you can base them on inn signs. So like, you know, House of the Red Lion, Tavern of the Red Lion or a personal name or like ancestor names. A lot of them are like places. And like I said, you can be a ship. Um, in my notes, I have a whole article on how names work. But the thing to kind of take away is that household names have their own you know, rules and their own kind of idea of your household as a persona. Mm -hmm. Household names, if you're the brotherhood of Wellington, it has, you have to be, you have to use both, both parts must be English That's, or French or, or if you, you have to be The person if you're doing, you know, La Fraternity de or yeah. Arles is the only French city you can think of. And uh, awards are also similar. And so for awards, we only go off of um, patterns we found in history of like nightly order names. Um, and you also need the designator and the substantive element. So, you know, you 
it can be a heraldic charge like Order of the Pretzel, or you can add a color, Order of the Silver Pretzel. Um, physical description, the winged pretzel. And the physical descriptions are only a couple of things that a charge or picture could reasonably like crowned or winged or something like that. Yeah, inflamed pretzel. You can't do order of the picky pretzel, though, because that's a bit too abstract. You could have two charges, order of the pretzel and salt cellar. Um, you can be a natural quality or virtue, like the order of prosperity. The Order of Chivalry. Um, you can do a person's name. that the, the Order is named after the Order of Prospero. You can do a saint's name. You can make up a saint. You don't have to use the ones the Catholic Church or Orthodox Church have recognized. The Order of St. Prospero. The Order of St. Prospero of Prato, if you want to add where he's from. You can do an object. The Order of St. Prospero's Pretzel. And you, something that comes up a lot in a period uh, orders is there was a piece of regalia they would be given, like you can't see it, but the Order of the Pantaloon is what I put there. But like the Order of the Garter, for instance, in all seriousness, was they, they got a special garter to show they were part of the Order. So let's say, hmm? yep, let's say you want to do, uh, you know, you want to figure out how to do names. So the College Arms has put out a lot of name articles written by heralds, just like you and me. And some cover name construction, some are uh, like just list of names. Somebody found a census in 1420 and pulled out all the names. Some are like databases kept by a university or academic project. And so, you know, the SCA College of Arms has all of these sorts of name articles on them. Also, yeah, so, you know, let's say I want to do Ireland. It just gives me a list of Irish name articles. Also, if you want to see something cool, the Morseless Herald, who is the basically the website herald of the SCA, made this cool little search form. So, uh, uh, so somebody give me a name. Edward. Good, solid name. I put in Edward here. I hit enter. And it gives me a list of every article with the name Edward in it. Yeah. <laughs> Morseless.org. It took me like a year and a half till I found out about it. And it is my favorite toy. So, name articles. Yes, that. Oh, no, please, please. Um, there is the Dictionary of Medieval Names from European Sources. This is a list of literally thousands of names that, um, and actually Escadian put together, that show what language it is found and where it is found. So let's say we go down to Edward. Edward, I know how to spell that. Yeah. No, I got it. Thank you, though. And so Edward, it shows, you know, the name is Old English. It shows that we find it in Belgium, in England, in all sorts of different forms. Dutch, modern English, you know, Italian. You get the idea. And it shows, gives you the year and what the source is and how it's spelled. And that is also just an incredibly useful site. The Dictionary of Medieval Names from European Sources. D-M-N-E-S. <laughs> yep. So there is Family Search, which is literally just a medieval, um, which is a genealogy website run by the LDS Church. But it has records going back to the, like, I think of the 13 or 1400s. And um, you can just look up names in it. I do it all the time. Um, it's really useful. Yeah, it's really useful for Western Europe. Once you get out of Western Europe, it's a lot less helpful. But for like Western Europe and some of the like uh, American colonies, it's, it's pretty useful. Now, you have to find a record with a batch number that you can use because they are they have their own system and not all of it is good. But yeah, so it either needs to have a certain batch number, and this is in the handout in the notes I'm going to send out after the class, or uh, you need to look at the actual record and read what it says, which um, handwriting, good handwriting wasn't invented yet, so you might have to kind of decipher it a bit. 
they're in I, I think they're in the the handbook yeah so let's say you're putting together documentation for a name to send to the college you need to know we need to know what the name is what language it is uh where you found the name uh when the name is from and if it's a time period like the reign of edward the second that's fine we just need a general area yeah um uh, so a lot of the sources i've given you are what's called no photocopy that means we assume that the heralds can look it up and know what it is or it's a book that somebody has a copy of it it's an authoritative source yep we approve this source you don't have to prove to us that this source is good. like the dictionary of medieval names if it's on that we all trust that it's good um <laughs> yeah yeah, definitely don't just get a baby book and be like, it says this is a name. Um, we're not even getting into Tiffany. Yeah, we, we do not have time for Tiffany. Um, so, and you need to show what the pattern is. All right, so any more questions about names? Cool. We're going to get into heraldry. Yay, heraldry. Everybody loves heraldry. Um, so some of this might be a bit, you know, a, a, a bit introductory, but I want to make sure bases are covered. So, okay, well, there you go. The background of a device is called a sh is called the field. It can be one color, it can be split into different parts. I've given some common field divisions here. These are not all of the field divisions. Um, but, you know, these are easy ways you can divide a shield in half. And um, I will be sending out notes after the class with the Senate, so, you know, you don't have to write down every field division right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you have what are called your central ordinaries. These are big geometric charges that you put on shields, and they're easy to make out. Um, the general idea how heraldry started is people would just paint their shield to be identifiable. You know, you Put a big stripe down the middle, and everybody knows that is, you know, Sado. Yep, that that's my stripe. And then it got more complicated from there. And you know, but um, you have the central ordinaries. These are big designs that go from edge to edge of the ship. And if you notice, these are all base the same thing, or not the same thing, but you know, the same lines. Yeah. yeah. You have peripheral ordinaries, which are on one edge of the shield, and these are um, a bit less important, you know, a bit less big and bold and important, came a little bit later. Um, hmm? Flaunches are pretty. No. Really? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I, I didn't even get into Journey and all of those. They're, these are not the only charges and ordinaries, but, you know, if if I did every single one, we'd be here all day. So you'll hear the word a ch ch charge a lot. A charge is any item you can put on a field. Ordinaries are charges, technically. You know, they're a special type. Um, charges can be almost any sort of plant or animal or tool or, you know, natural feature, a monster you've constructed. Yeah, some symbols, um, like the one in the middle is what's called the ruster is just a diamond with a hole in it. You can't register sing, single symbol letters. You can't register letters. Yeah. That's, that's kind of something you can't fix. Is there, I mean, I mean, on a few period, right? So to register a new charge that nobody's ever done, you have to show that it was something that was in use or that people knew about before 1600. Yeah. You could register an actress. Yeah, oh, you yeah. people have done it. Okay. So, and the rules used to be it had to be something known to Europeans, which was a bit limiting, especially if you have a non-European persona. They've changed the rules, so it's anything known to people. So, you know, now you can do, like, a well, we knew Lamas in period, but, you know, a polar bear or something, or, like, a kangaroo. Um, and 
so yeah, th those are charged. Like I said, anything you put on the field is a charge. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, but like if you want to be, you know, John's, you know, like John Robertson and you're registering a, you know, Japanese cherry blossom or a kangaroo or a, as, an axolotl from Central America, we, we don't police your persona. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, so we, we don't tell you what you can and can't do with your arms and names and heraldry. That's your problem. So mm -hmm. <laughs> something you'll hear about is posture, something called attitude. If you're talking about an animal, and these are all the different like poses you can put them into. And these aren't all of them. These are just some of the most common ones. So, you know, they can be sitting, standing, running, reared up to attack. Yep. And it can be a pose that the animal doesn't really do in nature. If you want a, like, sitting cow, you can do it. We're not going to tell you no. Um so yeah, these are post animal postures. Um, these are something that if you're doing any sort of animal will come up. Um, if you're doing like a fish or a bird, they have their own list of postures, which I didn't have time to get into today, but you know, they're similar to the kinds of ones you see here. Yeah. Also, just something to say about Heraldic Art, it's... Oh, I'll get there. Don't you worry. Um, even before they could do cut and paste, Heraldic Art was very cut and paste. It was very, like, limited, very, like, e made to be very easy to reproduce, very, like, you sh you'd be able to give a description in Heraldic terms, and people would know at least close enough what to draw. So that's why if I say it's a cat couchant, everyone knows it's a sitting cat, cat. You know, you don't have to get more complicated than that. So tinctures, these are like your color palette for heraldry. These are three main categories. A color which in heraldry is a dark color. So black, and they have heraldic names that are based on uh, Norman French. So black is sable, verd is green, red is gold. So this is very common. Yeah, azure is blue. Metals are ore and argent or gold and silver. And there's even two types of furs, which I'll get to, ermine and fair. Yep. Yeah. So, sure. There you go. So these are the tinctures. Sable, vert, azure, ghouls, ore, ver, purpur, argent, and ermine. Uh, you will hear a lot about the rule of tincture. What this says is you cannot put a metal on top of a metal or a color on top of a color. So the one on the left, too hard to see at a distance because gold and white are too, are both very light colors. The one in the middle, even harder to see at a distance. Black on uh, purple on black. But the one in the middle, the purple bear, uh, purple gear on the gold background, that's nice and visible. Now, there are ways to get around this rule. You know, you can find some crazy pattern the Italians were doing, but you know, if for simple, for for simple heraldry, roll a tincture. Um, now. A divided field or charge is considered neutral. So, like, these are both good because they're still pretty easy to see at a distance. If you divide the field in half or the deer in half. Although you still need good visual, um, good visual contrast. And that's why I put the head of the deer on the part that contrasts because that's the part of all the details. So, let's talk about furs. There's two of them. The first is ermine, and that is an ermine is a kind of a weasel animal, also known as a stoat. And they are white little black tips on their tails. And so, you know, medieval noblemen would use ermine fur on things, and it got abstracted that pattern of little three dot doohickeys, technical term. And there are some variations like orange and black is called. I think orange, I mean, uh, not orange, I think yellow, uh, black on yellow, is, is that pain? Or minois, no, black on yellow is pain. Yeah, or 
white and black is counter ermine. Uh huh. <laughs> Guess what his heraldry is. And you can, yeah, because you can do any combination of colors and uh, ermine spots. That would just be um, argent ermine prefer. Um, you know, it doesn't have a special name, but it's there. Um, and ermine, for contrast, you count it as the background color. So, you know, that's, you know, white would conflict with yellow if you put a yellow thing on that field. This is there. It is made of a uh, squirrel of a squirrel, uh, squirrel fur originally that was like flipped up so you'd have the white belly and the bluish gray fur. Um, no, I forgot to add a picture of something in here. Apparently, it was pictures of air. But um, this counts as a neutral because it's equally the bells and the white space. And you can also do that one in other colors. If you want to do yellow with green bells or something, we would not stop you. Yeah, if you really want to get complicated, you can do four different colors of the belts. You would just alternate them on, like, in four level patterns going down each line because you hate the herald or you hate the scribes, you have to draw it. Yes. One has ermine in the back of the swan, and one of the swan is ermine. Okay. Oh. He wants to actually get ermine again. <laughs> I bet. So you will hear about complexity. This, So we have a way to figure out how complex a device is. You count up the number of tinctures and charges. And if it's over eight, you'll probably get it returned. There's a few loopholes, but you're not here to learn loopholes today. Now, this is an SCA concept, but it's designed to make devices look more period. So, remember, you, if it's the colors versus the charges, or sorry, tinctures and charges. So, what is the complexity on this? Nope. Two colors. Or you have two tinctures, yeah. So, this is three, because you have Arjun, Purpur, and Llama. What is this one? <laughs> this is six because you have Argent for Pur. Uh, yeah, ghouls. And then the 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 then counts as a complexity. No. Just that there's two colors. Yes. That's a six. What about this nice simple device? Because they could. Yeah, because they, could. they thought they could. <laughs> so you have or you have prefer, you have ghouls, and you have the bear. It's nine, because then you, for, for the charts, you have the border, the llama, the garlic, and the star. You mean like this? Uh, so this is eight. Yeah. Yeah, eight is okay, nine is not. And also it looks a little, little bit better without the garlic star. They would ask eight whether or not it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'll hear talk about charge groups. These are how we, it's another SEAism where we group designs on the show together to kind of figure out uh, to kind of figure it out as a visual unit. And this is not a period thing, but it looks better because we do. It makes it look more period. So primary is the big thing in the middle of the shield. If it's in central ordinary, it's a central. Otherwise, it's the main charge. A secondary is either a second charge around the primary or a peripheral one like a border or a chief. A tertiary is anything that is um, on another charge, if you're stacking charges, it's tertiary. And if you're putting charge on charges on charges, it's quaternary and not allowed. And I know that's a lot to go over, so I have examples. These two are primary. 
Spectral is going to be a primary charge because you have the Chevron or just the big squirrel by itself. It is. <laughs> These are secondaries. The chief because the duck is primary and the mice because the cogwheel is primary. Does this all make sense? Yeah, it's a period, like, it's a period thing for mills. Yep. And then we get to this. So the, uh, so the frogs are tertiary because they're on the vent. But meanwhile, that griffin's head is on a circle called a roundel that is on that pile, which is another heraldic charge. So it is quaternary. So you can't do it. You have to take the griffin head off of it or do other, you know, or other creative things to make it work. The frogs would pass, the griffin's head would not. Does that all make sense? Uh, conflict checking, every herald's favorite thing to do. So there's two types of ways to clear a conflict, a substantial charge or a two distinct charges. And what conflict checking is, is we want to make sure every device that goes through the FCA is unique and unique enough that you won't confuse it for something else, even if it's technically different. So here we have our battling Mises. Um, you know, that is two moose rampant um, combatants. And so what can you do to make something that would clear it? If you take them off, it clears. If you turn the moose into uh, flamingos, well, flamingos and moose are different enough. Nobody's going to confuse them, I hope. If you just have one moose instead of two, it's different enough to pass. If you change it side by side, they're on top of each other. Or if you just make them on all fours looking at each other instead. Nope. If it's your primary charge, at least. If it's your secondary charge, it, I think it might count. But these are all for changing the the primary charge. I, I might have glossed over that. So if your primary charge is different in any of these ways, yeah. You also have, uh, you could do change the field. So we have that one bunnies now because I wanted to change it up. And if you got rid of the division, that would be different, or if you turn the division sideways. So just to give you some quick ideas how to do uh, to, to clear conflicts. You also have what's called uh, DC or uh, distinct charges. Uh, changes, you need two of those to clear a conflict. So we're, here we have our happy little love squid. And these are all different things you could do to add one DC. You need to do two of them to, change, to clear it completely. You could change the color of half the field. You could change where the line of division is between the two different things, make it wavy instead of just straight. And so the, all the hearts are the secondary charge groups, so you can... Uh, so, um, you know, if you change the number of the secondary charge group or added another charge group to it, like gave him a little hammer because he is a, you know, cephalopod who craves violence, you change where the hearts were to something else or change the color. And so change of orientation or I turned them uh, upside down. That would be the same if I if it was an animal and I changed the posture. So, um, yeah, there are different things you can do to clear a uh, to make two devices distinct. So let's say you want to go into design all of this heraldry, but you are a bad artist. Here's a list of programs that you can use. Yeah. Uh, I am a notoriously awful artist, but I have a I have a computer. I don't need to be good at art. Um, here's a list of some programs you can use. These are uh, many of these are free. Inkscape is free. GIMP is free. Um, I personally just use a Paint 3D, which came with my computer because I'm lazy like that. It's easy to use. But if all of these none of these work, you can just get Crayola markers and a pen. That is where they do it, like Harold's Point. And Crayola is good because it uh, it's easy to scan. Yeah, it has basic colors and it's easy to scan. We have to scan everything into computers. And also, just something to keep in mind, heraldry is a team sport. No herald knows everything. No herald can do everything. We all have our specialties. I am utter trash at Gaelic names. I'm not good at them. But I'm really good with Greek and Aztec. So, you know, I might call up my friend, the Gaelic Herald, and be like, how do I make this name work? 
or, you know, I might just go. So online, there's like a SCA Herald Facebook group. Um, usually the first couple of replies are good. It's Facebook. It doesn't always, you don't always get good responses. There's a Baby Heralds of the SCA Facebook group. There's even one just for the mid row. There's also a Discord called Known World Heralds, which um, I'll send, I'll have a link to in the documentation. Um, so yeah, talk to other Heralds in person or online. And thank you all for the class. Um...